Unfortunately, within the Christian uh, religion or faith here in India, uh, the caste poison penetrated the Christian faith as well. And it keeps us as slaves. We are still spiritual slaves, social slaves, and economic unequally suffering masses. Now they say you you should not look for God of universal nature. This is a problem. Well, hello and welcome along to this week's edition of the show. If you enjoy today's video, why not like it and subscribe to the channel as well? And you're always welcome to subscribe to our newsletter as well. You can find the info with today's video. Very excited about today's show. We're talking about Hinduism, caste and Christianity in India. Both my guests joining me from India today. Joseph D'Souza is Bishop of the Good Shepherd Church in India and a civil rights activist there. And Bishop Joseph will actually be joining us at this year's Unbelievable Conference on Saturday the 14th of May. Uh, Kancha Alaya Shepherd is a political theorist, human rights activist and author of books including his groundbreaking work critiquing the caste system in India called Why I Am Not a Hindu. So today really isn't a debate, it's much more a mutual exchange on the social, political and religious issues dominating India. We'll be talking about the Hindu caste system and the plight of the Dalit Bahujan, um, how this has impacted the Christian church in India and the present religious tensions that exist in the country under the nationalist Hindu BJP party led by Prime Minister Narendra Modi. So welcome Joseph and Kansha to today's show. Thank you, Justin. It's great to have you both. Um, been really looking forward to this. We've been working for a little while on setting up this conversation between you both. And, and it may well run to other conversations with other folk uh, from the Global South in the future. But first of all, let's introduce you both. Joseph, tell us about your role as Bishop of the Good Shepherd Church in India and how many believers that constitutes uh, within that network. And indeed, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about how many Christians there are overall on the Indian subcontinent. Uh the, the Good Shepherd uh, Church movement is uh, an Anglican church movement spread across the nation. Uh, we have uh, nine dioceses across uh, across the nation and uh, uh, six uh, Anglican bishops about to consecrate a new bishop this year. Uh, we are uh, also in the process of establishing a diocese of the Middle East. Uh, where uh, folk from there have approached us. And, um, and it's, a, it's a movement that has uh, come out of several, uh, many decades of engagement with India in a holistic way. And, and um, it's an attempt uh, to, and we'll talk about it, an attempt to to uh, work out uh, what it means to uh, be a church that uh, is centered around the gospel of the kingdom of God and a church that is centered around the restoration of human dignity to all people. Uh, and so as a church, we, we do church, but we are very active in the field of education across the nation. Uh, for those uh, who uh, don't have the opportunity, the poor, the oppressed. We also involved in massive healthcare, and we've been in the front lines in terms of healthcare in the COVID situation. We also work against any form of sexual uh, trafficking and work among communities. And then, of course, uh, empowering women through economic development and a host of other people. In terms of so civil society issues, we work with people of all faiths uh, and no faith for upholding what we believe are the fundamental values of the Constitution of India. So uh, we are grateful that uh, India continues to be uh, a democracy and that we can continue to exercise our faith the way we are doing now. Hmm. And and tell us a little bit about the the, the Christian population in India. How how many are, are the Christians are there estimated to be, and and how many do you specifically have under your care in the Good Shepherd Church network? Yeah, uh, the 
the in the Indian Christian population, according to the census, is supposed to be hovering around two point three percent or two point five percent. So, uh, in a population of one point three billion, it does add up to quite a lot of people. At the same time, there is uh, there is the recognition that there are a lot more Indians who are practicing the faith, who uh, do not would not identify themselves openly as Christians in the census, etc., for a variety variety of reasons. So it's very difficult to say what is the size of uh, size of the uh, Indian Church, but a safe safe. Uh, number is to go by the consent, uh, census number and talk about 30, 40 million people. We ourselves have tens of thousands of uh, practicing believers across the nation uh, in, co- uh, in over 2,000 plus congregations uh, spread across the nation and, uh, and uh, include people from most of the major languages uh, and uh, traditions. Well, that, that's that's a really helpful introduction to to your background, Joseph, and and the work you do, you know, across the board with the Good Shepherd Church Network. Um, really looking forward as well to having you at this year's Unbelievable Conference um, to represent a, a perspective from the global south, which I think is so often missing very often in in conversations. And I'm really glad to have this opportunity to explore some of the issues with yourself and Kancha today. Um, Kancha, welcome to the show as well. Um, tell us a bit about your background. I know that your this groundbreaking book, Why I'm Not a Hindu, came out about uh, probably over 25 years ago now. Um, and and it really was uh, a critique of the caste system in India. T- tell us about your work in that regard and, and what that book was about, uh, Why I'm Not a well, Hindu. Well, I come from a... Uh very illiterate uh, shepherd family from a very deep uh, rural South India. And uh, my parents, my siblings, all of them have been illiterate. Somehow I was sent to school along with, with my elder brother, which was a single teacher school under the tree from there, I studied in uh, Telugu medium uh, up to high school at the uh, regional level and then came up to graduation at district level and then came to my MA course uh, to Hyderabad, where I now live, then uh, in a university called Usmania. There I did my MA political science, MPhil and also PhD. And it was during this whole period, uh, I was facing all kinds of humiliations around my physical formation, around my name. Uh, People can easily understand that I come from a very backward community within the, what we call broad shudras. Uh, I don't come from an untouchable family, but I come from a very low-end Shudra artisanal shepherd community. Now, added to this, when I was in the university, uh, where I studied, I also got a teaching job there. And uh, during this course, the right-wing students and the left-wing students were conflicting with each other. And as a student, I was with the socialist movement. But gradually I realized this Hindu religious fundamentalism was growing among the students and it was threatening the first generation educated people uh, because the question of self-respect, the question of India reflects uh, names, uh, religion, and caste backgrounds are reflected in the names also, or in the styles of living, clothes. So uh, by 1990, when 
we were given first time reservation through a constitutional process. There was a huge backlash of Brahmins who were the top caste or priestly community and uh, the other upper caste. Then we were trying to defend, I, I was one of the activists in that. But then we used to be verbally attacked and our culture used to be attacked and they were saying that we are incapable of becoming anything in educational system. It was then I thought of uh, writing a book. Now, why we should be Hindu when we don't have the basic rights there? We can't go to the temple. If we go, we can't get into priesthood position. We can't read the book, though we are not untouchable. And we can't have the same body symbols that the Brahmins who are like the Pharisees of Israel have, uh, you know, a thread across the body and all kinds of things. Then I thought of telling the country and the world that from childhood to death, how the, the Brahmins, the Banyas who are the richest now doing the monopoly capitalist business and both Narendra Modi also comes from that background though he took an OBC certificate. So how all of them exploit us and make money and then educate themselves in foreign countries and come back and exploit us. So this book is, this book tells from my childhood to my community's death, their childhood to their death and we have historical gods and goddesses of our own and which have broadly some sort of a, you know, vague kind of linkages to the ancient civilizational practices where mm -hmm. perhaps people must have thought that God is one but reflects in several forms but mostly in the production forms. You know, a goddess is a like a doctor or a tank builder or a water storer or, you know, so many other things. Whereas their gods were having weapons and came from books. So then this, after this book came, there were a lot of uh, abusive uh, uh, attacks through writing and through, you know, small physical kind of attempts. But the book became bestseller within an year. And even now, it is one of the best sellers across India. And it has really changed yeah. the discourse on Hindu religion. Well, th this is why I'm so interested in having you on, Kancha, alongside Joseph today, because because of this, this voice you have given to these lower castes. And you yourself, as you said, are from the Shudra caste. Um, which, as you say, is not the untouchable caste, which at least a, a number of people are aware of the, the Dalit community in India. But but many people just simply, and I include myself here, are, are fairly unknowledgeable about the caste system in general. Perhaps you could give us a very quick lesson in in the caste system. Um, as I understand it, there is the Brahmin caste. Uh, I may mispronounce these, the uh, Kaishatriya caste, the uh, Vaishyas the Shudra and, and Dalit in general terms. Do you want to sort of give us an explanation of what those are and what what social standing, if you like, is involved with each type of caste in, in the Hindu well, system? You know, India is a very ancient civilization. Uh, goes back to uh, six to 7,000 agricultural civilization. But when the Aryan migration took place around 1500 BCE, they came as a, a war uh, heroes to India and uh, the remaining, the indigenous population were basically agriculturists and uh, animal grazers and uh, producing food for themselves and shipping fishing and, you know, hunting. The first change occurred through uh, to established caste when the Brahmins have written a book called Rigveda. They claim this, that Rigveda is as old as the 
Old Testament and uh, the Genesis section. In that they said, God created human beings unequal into four categories. So Brahmins, those who can read the books, those who can do the priesthood, or those who should not touch any productive work, any they should not soil their hands. Then the Kshatriyas were supposed to rule the country or people. The Vaishyas are supposed to do the business. The Shudras were supposed to produce food and serve the three higher hegemony, higher groups. There was no Dalit community at that time. So as time went on, the Brahmins declared that leather production, leather work is more untouchable than tilling of the soil or uh, producing food. And they were, leather workers were made untouchable. And uh, so it is exactly like, you know, at the Jesus times, there were Pharisees, there were Gentiles. The Shudras were like Gentiles, doing all the work and, uh, okay. but they are not from outside, but within India and the most indigenous people historically. And uh, like Samaritans, these untouchables. And uh, their water is not touched, their food is not touched, and they are not supposed to come inside. So these uh, four communities were divided into further castes as the time went on, and they wrote their own books. We were not supposed to read. Now the tragedy is the Shudra population is 52% of the total population. And uh, that means it works out roughly about 750 million people and more. And they don't have the right to become the priest. They don't have the right to read the scripture in Sanskrit language uh, at the early stages and become anything in the philosophical uh, spiritual domain. So uh, the Dalits are untouchables. The constitution tried to abolish this untouchability, but not the caste system. So as a result, what happens is, the fear of the Brahmins says, after Christianity came in the first century, caught up more in the down south, then in the seventh century, Islam started. The fear of their, their says, that if the Shudras become either Muslim or Christian, they were afraid of they becoming more Muslims at one time. Now they are afraid of they becoming Christian now because Christianity is an evangelical religion now. Islam is not. Mm. So if that happens, India will become a major non-Hindu country. And which is only country situated between the Muslim 56 countries on the one side, the western side, and the Buddhist countries on the eastern side. And somehow there is no eastern big nation, Christian big nation in the east. So they think that this will go perhaps to Christianity if the Shudras realize and get education, particularly English education. So that becomes the mm. issue of you know, anti-minority campaigns. Yeah, so there is a fear that we, we, my Chudra communities and the Dalits, more and more Dalits are going into Christianity now. Those, so there's a very famous reformer called Ambedkar, who studied in Colombia uh, and came here and he wrote the constitution. And he embraced Buddhism as against Hindu, uh, religious practices. But after he embraced Buddhism, what the right-wing RSS BJP people sees, more and more Dalits became Christians, not Buddhists. So Ambedkar has opened the lock of the right to conversion and people see Christianity as a better option. So that is where the problem are there. Yeah. 
yeah well let, let me come back to you joseph and that's such a helpful description of the way the caste system has developed historically and the current issues that exist um do you, if you don't mind me asking joseph which which caste have you been part of I, yourself i'm from the upper caste uh, uh justin and and if even if you are not necessarily a hindu you are obviously a christian does does your caste still if you like apply it's just as kind of social fact if you like in, uh, in the indian continent uh, not not really because christianity is seen as a non indian thing uh, okay. by the by those who follow the caste system and and uh, so um but uh, within the unfortunately within the christian uh, religion or faith here in india uh, the caste poison penetrated the christian faith as well and mm. just like racism penetrated the west western christianity caste has also poisoned indian christianity so so uh, and which is which is an anathema if you believe in the gospel of the kingdom of god where you know um, uh, christ in christ there is no upper caste and lower caste but the fact that there is caste in the church makes it a very very problematic one and so over the years for 30 years now nearly uh, following the examples of great christian reformers like wilberforce and lincoln and others i have been led to raise my voice and expose the casteism within the church and mm. call out the church in india and of course call out the church in the west for their racism but for casteism in the indian church and so uh, uh, there's a whole chapter devoted to that in one of my books about caste in the church to what extent has the indian government over the years been successful or not successful in redressing the discrimination against lower caste indians well uh in the 1950 we adopted the new constitution and uh, over a period of time uh, undoubtedly the anti untouchability struggles of the reformers and education uh partly because of the christian missionary education that went more into the dalit communities not so much among the shudras say for example we are shepherds which is a large community in india but we are uh, hardly you know hardly handful of shepherds can uh, speak english and write english but there are number of dalits so reforms are happening uh, during the congress regime under the rubric of secularism and pluralism and so on there was uh, some kind of uh, social change uh, at the same time you know holding on to the hegemony of the brahmins and others in the spiritual domain in educational domain and so on but side by side the right wing hindus were organizing again as the change and that right wing hindu struggled to come to power though mainly projecting themselves as anti muslim because of the partition of the country in 1947 because pakistan and bangladesh was part of us at that time and muslim population in 1947 was around 34% so after that they became more alert and uh, they stopped particularly the shudras and dalits getting into english medium education how did how did they do that mm. they got english medium education through private schools even the christian missionary schools and uh entrepreneur schools monopoly houses started their own school we had no access we had to go to government school only study in regional languages therefore we could not understand the world we could not understand the transformation for example i myself 
did not get English education in any English medium school or in Christian missionary school. I learned on my own in the process of my education. So there is change, no doubt. And because of the change, there is more fear among the Brahmins and others because change always can ask for equality as it did in America. Because the American Civil War, after 100 years of independence, uh, came through the English medium and the Christian Church of the Blacks. And Martin Luther King emerged there. So they are now afraid of our education in English. So that is mm. the reason why my friendship started with Joseph. I requested him to start English medium schools in villages for Shudras and Dalits. One such school is started 20 years back in my village. And now you can see that small village producing high quality engineers, high quality, you know, from Adi tribals, from Dalits, from OBCs. So there is change and there is this checkup to that change. There is a, there is a check to that change. And the bigger check is from the right wing mm. right now, from power position. Okay. Well, we, we'll, we'll delve into this more in the next segment of today's show, and particularly the way that the Christian church has been involved <clears throat> in these um, social changes. And, you know, I know that there has been a large influx from especially the Dalit community into the Christian church, but that's obviously comes with its own, uh, yeah, you know, religious tensions that, that exist. So we'll, we'll be exploring this more as we continue today's show. You're listening to an edition of Unbelievable, looking at Hinduism, caste and Christianity in India. My two guests are Bishop Joseph D'Souza and Kansha Ilya Shepherd. We'll be back in just a moment's time. If you enjoy watching The Unbelievable Show, why don't you come along and experience it live? There are two amazing opportunities coming up. Firstly, our Unbelievable Live event with Philip Yancey. The veteran writer and Christian thinker will be joining me to talk about his life and ministry and to answer your questions on Jesus, faith and the church. In fact, we're calling it Ask Philip Yancey Anything. So ask away on our live webinar on Tuesday the 1st of March. It's free, but you need to register at unbelievable.live. Not only that, we've just launched ticketing for our annual Premier Unbelievable Conference. It's happening on Saturday the 14th of May, live from the historic venue of the British Library in London. You can join in person or online from anywhere in the world. God Unmuted is our theme. In a confused and divided age, learn how the church can find its authentic voice again. Our seminars, discussions and Q&A will include Alistair McGrath, Lisa Fields, Glenn Scrivener, John Wyatt, Bishop Joseph D'Souza, Sky Jatani and Phil Vischer, helping you to speak with truth and grace in uncertain times. It's hosted by myself with more guests to be announced. Again, you can be part of Unbelievable 2022, God Unmuted and our Ask Philip Yancey Anything event from anywhere in the world. Just visit Unbelievable. Live. Well, welcome back to today's show, talking about Hinduism, caste and Christianity in India. My guests are Joseph D'Souza, Bishop of the Good Sh Shepherd Church in India, and uh, Kansha Elia Shepherd, who's a political theorist, human rights activist and author of books, including Why I'm Not a Hindu. Um, so we've heard, obviously, about the caste system in in Hinduism, Joseph, and some of the issues uh, regarding that, the untouchables, the Dalits and so on. Um, and and that there's been a big movement, really, to, to have recognition of um, rights, education and so on uh, for these communities. To what extent, though, has this, you know, been I understand there's been quite an influx of people from the Dalit community, perhaps also the Shudra community to Christianity. What, 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 what's your thoughts on that? What, what have you seen happen in, in the last few decades? Uh, it's, uh, it's not just in the last few decades. Historically, uh, Justin, uh, there, is, um, there is this great attractiveness of Jesus Christ and the message of Jesus Christ and the life of Jesus Christ to uh, a wide section of uh, India's population. 
and and um, you know uh, because uh, even though Christians have not articulated properly, because Jesus in the Gospel of the Kingdom offers one humanity uh, as a message of salvation, that in Christ, you know, we we are one, um, and dignity and equality is given to us, and and then. Uh, there's this phenomenal teaching in the Bible and in the New Testament that we are all created in the image of God. Uh, and then, of course, the unconditional love of Jesus. So historically, from ancient times, uh, this has attracted uh, sections of the Indian population uh, to Jesus Christ. And a, a good section among uh, the so-called Dalits, tribals, and even the Sudras uh, have uh, turned to faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, we also have the phenomena in certain parts of the nation where upper caste people have turned to faith in Jesus. And uh, women especially have turned to faith in Jesus. And so uh, it has not been as is as the propaganda uh, goes through any forced campaign or a fraudulent means but it is the voluntary choice of people to find what makes a sense to them and to find the god that gives meaning to their life so yes uh, the downtrodden not just in india around the world the working class and others like in England during the awakening and all, always find the message of Jesus and the life of Jesus very appealing and the the notion of his unconditional love very, very powerful. And so the voluntarily, they they turn to faith uh, in Christ. Mm. Now, that that is obviously what you've seen happening, obviously from uh, uh, the the perspective of the Hindu Nationalist Party, the JBP and so on they're very concerned it would appear at this kind of movement so what what does that look like for you as a pastor on the ground in terms of the kind of pressures that the christian church is facing are you able to freely speak of faith to evangelize and so it's, on it's uh, it's become very very difficult in the last uh, couple of decades um and uh, we we have become the target of a vicious demonization uh, campaign uh, on this issue itself of people embracing Jesus Christ. And consistently, I've been saying and we have been saying that the Christian church in India, and so for that matter, the Christian church around the world, we are li living in 2021 or in the 21st century, the idea of forced conversions or fraudulent conversions is anathema to the Christian world. Most of the same Christian world would not uh, agree to anything like this. And so, so categorically, we, we are against any forced and fraudulent conversions. And I would be myself very uncomfortable if somebody says he wants to be, become a Christian for some ulterior motive. I mean, it's just not on. The other thing is, uh, you have to recognize this kind of uh, this kind of an allegation uh, could have made sense when we are under the colonial rule. But for the last seventy years, we are no more under the colonial rule. This is a country ruled by Hindus, and all of the levers of power are with them. How on earth could Christians even think of engaging in forced and for? I'm talking about Indian conversion. It's not possible. And the other thing is that despite all of the anti-conversion laws, we yet have to see a case where a group has been engaging, engaged in forced and fraudulent conversions and has been convicted by a court. That has not happened. And so, so yes, the, the extremists may find it uh, um, very difficult to understand uh, what's going on here when people embrace Christ. And I think 
the phenomenal problem for the Hindu extremists is not understanding the, the, the whole dynamic of what happens when people embrace and decide to follow Jesus Christ. The spiritual dimension, the social, the intellectual dimension. There is no concept in them, uh, in their understanding, that these are all voluntary experiences people are having with Jesus Christ. And no amount of pressure or anything uh, is going to uh, frighten these people who have embraced Jesus Christ. So, so yes, the, the attacks are there, but it's very difficult. And especially this last Christmas season and all, uh, it has been horrendous in the state of Karnataka. And sadly, um, the other fear, of course, uh, is, is just in really uh, a, a historical misunderstanding about what evangelization is supposed to do or achieve. Mm. There is this nonsense going around, which I have challenged, of the whole thing of a Christian nation. Uh, uh, there is no agenda anywhere either with Christians in India or around the world of turning any nation into a Christian nation. And there's no, I mean, Jesus said there's no such philosophical, theological base. So there is this fear. I, I can categorically say that even if significant numbers of people turn to faith in Jesus Christ, the idea of us having a politicized, political Christian nation in India is not on the minds of any Christians here or abroad. And the, the problem, though, in a sense, Kansha, is that there is obviously a significant aspect of the, the, the ruling class who want to see India categorized as a Hindu nation and therefore would would see anyone of another faith as somehow you know not representing true indian you know cultural heritage and, and everything else i mean your your view as i understand it kansha is that for you this is a relatively recent idea that that indians are automatically somehow hindu if they if they are born into you know the the indian sort of subcontinent or way of life you 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 think you you and that's why you have rejected the label hindu yourself as I, as i understand but it kansha the issue is that uh, if Hinduism is being defined by the right wing as a religion like Christianity, Islam, Buddhism and so on, uh, we all should have the right to religion, which is now lacking. That as a Shudra, uh, one is a tiller, one is a pot maker, one is a cattle grazer, you know, uh, the Dalits are uh, leather workers or labor and so on. Now, how they cannot become priests in the temple? Now, many religions as of now are allowing only men. Uh, that way even Christianity uh, is struggling with women coming into the higher positions of uh, priesthood. But even the men from these castes cannot become a priest. Now, what does it mean that we are Hindu? We don't have the right to read the scripture, learn about it. And they say that uh, only Sanskrit should be the language of God. Uh, which Islam also thinks that Arabic should be the language of Allah. Now, Christianity somehow overcame that. Any language is language of God. Now, this certainly is an attraction to people who are denied access to the idea of God. Now, their fear is that if the Shudras, the Dalits, and the tribals, if they get educated, they will either ask for equality in Hinduism totally, because if they are saying that, you know, this is the form of Hinduism, they will either ask for that, which they are not prepared, or they will go into something else. Because my feeling is, still human mind in the world is ruled by God more than the state or state laws. 
God is a significant ruler of human mind. Now, from that chunk of, you know, God control people, the Shudras, Dalits, uh, you know, tribals who constitute about, let us say, uh, 800 uh, more uh, million people. Now, how can you keep them ignorant in 21st century with a globalized economy? Now, their problem is that we should be still slaves spiritually and producing economic goods and commodities for their well-being. But now we challenge. Because this is exactly the challenge of the Dalit Shudra obesis in India, what Jesus' time shepherds, fishermen, and others challenged the existing religious power of Israel. Now, in my view, there was a caste system in Israel. Except the Pharisee, nobody could become the high priest. Jesus himself was not allowed to start his preaching in his own birthplace. So, we were kept ignorant. We were treated as body, human body, but not human as human mind. But now, after independence, fortunately for us, there was a Dalit, great reformer. And that reformer injected in us that you are also equal in the eyes of God. Now, this is the challenge. I have been asking repeatedly, either you give us equality in all the temples, the right to read, establish schools, colleges to study theological systems as you prescribe the syllabus, our children will be ready for that. If they want to go elsewhere, now then how do you stop? Because God is universal. God is not national. Whereas the Hindu right-wing people, this is only religious group in the world, the Brahmins. In whatever political formation they are, in whatever religious structure they are, they think that Indian God is different. Indian God is a nationalist God. Now this we contest. God can never be a nationalist. God is universal. If there are more than uh, 80, 90 Christian countries, more than 56 Muslim countries, and there are seven, 10, about 10 Buddhist countries, China, Japan, Korea, you know, so on. And why Hinduism remained only here? And it keeps us as slaves. Yeah. We are still spiritual slaves, social slaves, and economic unequally suffering masses. Now, they say you, you should not look for God of universal nature. This is a problem. Well, so do you welcome the, those, the, the fact that many people in the Dalit and Sudra community have turned to Christianity? Do you see that as a, as a positive thing overall, Kancha? No, I would say that people sought a solace even in the utter poverty in the realm of God on equal basis with a book in the hand and a God's prayer and so on. But what they did was very interesting. When they gave us a reservation, they said only Hindu Dalits and Hindu OBCs will get reservation. If somebody takes so uh, more than 50% of Dalits, Christian Dalits today, don't have the right to reservation. What do you mean by a reservation? To, just, just for my benefit. It is an affirmative action for getting prioritized education and prioritized jobs like the blacks in America. And uh, so they said, if you are not within the Hindu fold as unequals, if you go into Islam or into Christianity, 
you are not eligible for getting this preferential treatment. But the people who, who, who became Christians, the Dalits, their, their poverty does not get upgraded, uh, changed within a day, within years. They still remain Dalits in the villages. Because unfortunately, the church in India was also casteist. The Brahmins who became Christians in the second century, third century, fourth century, did not uh, become casteless. They operated in the caste mode. They did not give us English education. Catholic institutions mainly educated the upper caste. So this is the problem. Now we need to work for a global agenda of removing caste inequalities from this land itself as we are determined uh, in the domain of God itself that we are determined to remove race inequalities through United States, through mm. other forms of uh, expressions and struggles and so on. But we don't get universal support. We don't get Western support. See, how can somebody be converted with for some dollars? Th that is not possible. Human beings do not get into a new religion because you are getting few dollars. It is a question of human being and God relationship. Joseph, just to bring you in on this, I mean, do you see, I mean, obviously in the last couple of years, there's been a great focus on racism in the USA, uh, the George Floyd protests and the Black Lives Matter movement and so on. I mean, do you see this as, as if you like India's sort of racist equivalent and and to, to that extent is is there enough being done on an international level to recognize the kind of discrimination that is yeah that is happening? Uh, justin i see uh i see uh globally uh one of the defining issues of our time of this decade our next couple of decades is, uh, the issue of racism and caste and it touches all of us. It touches the West, it touches the East. Because there is a convulsion going on in societies everywhere. And of course, the symptoms may be polarization, violence, this, that, and the other, the black life movement everywhere. But across societies, including in India, there is a deep, deep yearning in the, in the human spirit for human dignity and equality. And, and unfortunately, uh, the world has, glo the global um, audience has not grasped up until now, the insidious nature of caste. And finally, of course, this lady Wilkinson, black lady, wrote the book called Caste in the US became a bestseller and and she finally hit the nail on the head when she sees the roots of racism is based on the ideology of caste. She says racism is just the flesh and bones but caste defines you by birth. Doesn't matter what you achieve in life, what education you get, who you are born as is what defines you. It's not even, you know, as some have sought to do, a matter of skin color. You know, uh, uh, racism is not merely a matter of a black and white race. It is, it is more fundamentally, do you believe all human beings are born equal or not? And, and, History shows that we as humans will not give other humans the same value and dignity. So it's an age old problem, but because of modern technology and globalization and all, this yearning has come to the fore. And whether the Hindu extremists want to accept it or not, caste as a form of racism is also now understood by more and more people. And it is in India's best interests. In fact, for those who 
uh, want to even preserve Hinduism. It is in Hinduisms. I mean, when I use the word Hinduism, I'm using it in the classical sense, okay, not in the current form it is understood. It's in everybody's best interest, and especially in India's best interest, that caste is dealt a mortal blow, and we come out of this curse that has been inflicted on our nation. Can can you simply leave it behind though? Because it sounds to me that as though it is very much baked into Hindu theology. I mean, as and correct me if I'm wrong here, Kantra or Joseph, but as I understand it, obviously in in Hinduism there is this belief in karma, in reincarnation, and to that degree, caste is seen as as a sort of you know a, an effect of a life that you have lived, and then you live in this particular caste, and therefore it's. You, you know, it's divine justice, it's karma and so on, if if you have been born into these, these lower castes and so on. So can that simply be, a, can, I mean, can you get rid of that if, if that's very, very much part and parcel of the, of the Hindu philosophy? So, uh, you see, uh, the way, I, I think there are many battles going on. Uh, one is, of course, the battle for the soul of Indian civilization and what the Indian civilization represents vis-a-vis -vis what the Hindu extremists are trying to tell us. Okay. Now, yes, caste and uh, all of that is linked to a specific, specific version of Hinduism that's been fostered on the nation for a long, long time. But I can't see why India as a nation cannot reject the caste system, which does mean dismantling a lot of the systems, of course, and that's very thing. But for the greater good of India and the Indian people, of course, you're, I mean, the sheer numbers that we have been told today, huge numbers of people cannot be consigned to this kind of secondary live, living. So I am one who feels that because India, though uh, the demographics and all say in India, in what way is India a Hindu nation? You know, is India monolithically Hindu? No. Is Hinduism monolithic? No. Some are trying to make it. India is an amalgamation of tribes, as we have seen the original caste, those Dalits, then now we hear about the Sudras. So can it be thrown away and reject? And can a movement rise that says ideologically this is not on? The constitution has given us a great footing. It needs to go further, but it can, it can be fought. I'm one who believes because caste has infiltrated Christianity. Correct me if I'm wrong. Caste has infiltrated the other religions in India too. So we all have a common battle on our hand as Indians, uh, regardless of our faith, saying, how do we check it out? And if in the process of checking it out, we have to reform some of our theology and some of our understanding, just as Kancha just referred to the ordination of women as priests, let's, let's work on it. So I am one who feels it can be done, but it has to come from within the system. Christians, we as Christians from outside cannot do it. It has to come within mm. the social structure mm. of, uh, of what is Hinduism or India right now for that kind of an impetus to, uh, I think the women are going to be extremely key to this. Other progressive forces are going to be extremely key to it. People like Kanchi are going to be extremely key to it. But it has to go. Just it has to go for the sake of India and the sake of the world. Mm. We, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back in a moment to conclude this discussion today on Hinduism, caste and Christianity in India. Joining me today, Bishop Joseph D'Souza and Kancha Ilya uh, shepherd uh, and we'll we'll get some concluding remarks as well on the future of religion and culture and so society in india uh, towards the end of today's show we'll be back in just a moment for more conversations between christians and skeptics subscribe to the unbelievable podcast and for more updates and bonus content sign up to the unbelievable newsletter 
So we've been talking today about Hinduism, caste and Christianity in India. Uh, and by the way, I will leave links from today's show to both of my guests, Bishop Joseph D'Souza and Kancha Alia Shepherd uh, and the books as well that have been mentioned, Why I'm Not a Hindu and others that, that Kancha has written. And, and I know Joseph has also authored books as well. Um, Joseph will be joining me uh, along with many others for Unbelievable the Conference uh, this year, uh, Saturday the 14th of May. Um, so do check out the, the notes with today's show as well uh, for more on that. Um, Kancha, thank you for the time that you've spent sort of talking about the history of India, the caste system and so on. What about the future? I mean, uh, do you feel like there is still a lot of resistance to this movement that you've been part of to see uh, equal rights for lower castes? Um, do you think that the if you like the momentum is in your favor that that you will see change in india uh what what's your view on on the future here well justin uh the i, I am very hopeful because uh, because of two reasons one this democracy and the constitution that we accepted now gives us the right to educate us and to look at the world and see the change that is happening all around. I'll give you one example. If you look at the screen of three of us, as you ask the question of race, you are of one color, Joseph is of another color, I am of another color. So uh, he's, he, he maybe he must have come from a Brahmin heritage a uh, long time back, and you are a white European, I look like a black in this, uh, even this. But the question is, do I have an equal right or not? We have taken this question to United Nations in 2001, the Bern Conference, and Indian government did not allow us to table the resolution, and the UN also did not accept because the countries did not support us for abolition of birth-based inequality. So, but yet, it somehow we fought through and then whatever the right-wingers are trying and whatever the liberal upper caste are stopping us in whatever way they could, because media is in their hands, educational institutions are in their hands, and the global linkages are in their hands, Yet, we could make caste and untouchability a global issue now. And that is the reason why American universities today say put caste uh, discrimination as an issue of their campuses. And even Britain hopefully will do. But what is important is in this globalized world, when our prime minister went and met uh, Pope, the present Pope, and then he invited him to come to India. His own party people were trying to attack him. Why are you inviting a Pope who gave a call for, you know, a Christianization of the East in the 21st century? Now, the question is, nobody can stop this. My hope, other hope comes from English education. And that is where my association with Joseph started, as I said earlier. Now, once the world realizes we need English as a language to communicate between one end of the tribal child, a Dalit child, a, a Shudra child, and the world in this internet era, I think liberation will happen. Liberation will happen in the spiritual domain. Liberation will happen in the social domain. Liberation will happen in political and economic domains. Because after all, God created the idea of equality also. Even the Christian idea of God was different before Martin Luther. But Martin Luther changed that idea of God, that God created the idea of equality along with human beings and idea of dignity of labor. You know, if uh, if uh, 
by biblical God saw the universe and worked for six days. He worked for six days and seventh day he rested. That is the work culture. And then Cain and Abel were, one was a shepherd and one was a agriculturist. So they had the work culture there. And we need to build similar spiritual equalitarian idea among our people. If we can speak English from one end to another end, all our people can communicate in one language. You know, I am very impressed with one statement of Jesus, uh, uh, you know, the Last Supper or some other, that a day will come when all human beings will speak one language. Human beings will communicate with each other. Now that we don't have right now. Uh, uh, so uh, let us hope that the whole world will come to our rescue, will see our problem. Uh, but definitely I am hopeful about the change in India. Mm. Mm. And how about you, Joseph? What, what are you... Are you hopeful in the same way? Um, I'm hopeful and yet it depends, you know, what looking at the global forces at play. I think it a lot depends upon uh, the Christian church. You know, uh, unfortunately for us, uh, Justin, we have been so used to a gospel whose main business is to take us up to heaven and then leave us totally unconnected with the issues of the world. And whereas the gospel always is the spiritual becoming physical, God creates the earth, the spiritual being creates the earth. This God becomes man and he comes on the earth. I mean, we have got it all upside down because of a cultural uh, bias. And so if the church is not engaged with the issues that matter, and at this particular time and for this uh, conversation, it is the issue of human dignity, justice, and human equality. It doesn't matter whether somebody is a Christian or comes to Christ or not, but if righteousness and justice reigns, the kind of Christianity I believe is that my God is glorified in that. The Christian God is glorified. And in the glorification of the biblical God is the testimony to the power of the gospel of the kingdom of uh, God. And, and so if the church does not stay as a bystander when the whole world goes through all kinds of issues, and I'm not saying the church has always been a bystander. I know in the early centuries, when all the plagues uh, sort of hit, the church was there right in the front. And uh, somehow the church has to get out of living in a bubble where they are worried about their safety first, rather than getting involved in the struggles of people. So whether it is the equality of women or the equality of children, um, the church has to deliver uh, on what the gospel is talking about. The more the church becomes more active and delivers, uh, we can be be hopeful. But at the same time, when I said that, as it is, um, as uh, I said, depend the forces of uh, extremism are running rampant, and there seems to be no control. And I'm worried that something may trigger massive violence in some part of the world here in India and some other part of the world. And human hate now against each other is reaching a peak. And unless something of the kingdom is brought into society and there are the peacemakers whom Jesus wanted, we might uh, have to go through some convulsion before we realize, man, what have we set loose? So that concern is there and I can't ignore that uh, concern, uh, not just for India, but other parts of the world where hate seems to be on the rise in multiple ways. So I'm hopeful uh, because uh, the gospel is about hope. Mm. Look, it's, it's been great to be able to spend some time with you both and to, and to hear about these important issues. Um, uh, I'm aware that we could only scratch the surface in many ways of, of what's going on in India. 
But um, yeah, it's great to hear of the work that your own church network is doing, Joseph, in this regard, and the your own activism as well, Kantra. And I will make sure there are links to both of you for anyone who wants to pursue this further and support the work that you're both doing. But for now, thank you very much for being with me on today's show. Thank you very much, Welcome. Justin. For more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter.